So this is the uh, last video for art. Uh, this is Mr. Salmingo. I would put a video of me, but it's 5 in the morning right now, and I'm pretty sure nobody wants to watch that. So um, let's get through this. This is the last section. Uh, today in class, you learn section 3. Um, and so I'm going to rush through and finish section 4 before your uh, scrimmage on Thursday. So this one's about Europe envisions the empire. So uh, during the height of the British Empire, most residents of the Great Britain uh, never visited the colonies. So, since they never saw it, um, they had these romantical, crazy visions of what it looked like in the colonies. Maybe it was exotic and stuff like that. Um, at this time, most artists, they never really criticized it because um, everybody thought it was a good thing. Um, more modern artists now have the opportunity to criticize and complain about it, but during the time, no one complained about it. And then there's also this key term called the noble savage. This is uh, the perception of foreign people. They were uncivilized and um, uh, consequently more simple, pure, and to be envied. So the noble savage was somebody actually that they admired because, oh, they're, they're so nice and, and humble people, and um, too bad we can't be like that. So this was this term called the noble savage. Um, so we're going to look at a couple of art pieces, just like in the other previous sections. So first, uh, we'll talk about the artist, uh, Benjamin West, born in Springfield, Pennsylvania. He taught himself to paint. Uh, Will if this makes it helpful, Will Smith, William Smith, helped him find patrons in education. He moved to Europe and then became a court painter to King George. Uh, he was a founding member of the Royal Academy. And um, one of his uh, controversial paintings is called The Death of General Wolfe. And um, this, uh, this is the picture right here. And it was controversial because they wore uh, contemporary clothing as opposed to classical drapery. So... Um, this, uh, this is General uh, Wolf, and they're, uh, he's painting his death, and uh, they're outraged. I don't know why it was so controversial, but they were really pissed off about what they were wearing in this painting. Um, so, again, we're, we're looking at different artwork. Um, so, Benjamin West is the artist. This is the subject. This is who he uh, drew. Um, William Penn, he was born in London and connected to a wealthy family. He favored the Quakers, um, he wanted religious refuge, and he founded Pennsylvania because he wanted a place to um, practice his religion safely. Uh, Penn, he also wanted to name his land Sylvania, which means forests, so that's why it's called Pennsylvania, so maybe that's a FYI, or maybe you didn't know that. And he was known for actually treating, uh, remember when they came over to the United States, the a lot of colonists were very mean to the Native Americans. Uh, William Penn was actually known to be nice. So here's the artwork. Um, it might be a tad small, but I'll show it to you um, larger in person. But this is the one that you need to know. It's called Penn's Treaty with the Indians. Uh, it's by Benjamin West. Um, William Penn, uh, this person, is, is presenting uh, gifts to the Lenape people or the Native Americans. This probably occurred under an elm tree. And um, 1682, 1683, it focuses on two European men offering a bolt of cloth to the chief. So this is it right here. I know, I know it's hard to see. Um, I wonder if I could sort of... Oh, okay. So is this easier for you guys to see? So uh, we, we've got uh, the Europeans to the Lenape uh, tribe, Native Americans, and offering them a bolt of cloth. Okay. Um, here he illustrated the differences between Indians and Europeans to justify expansion and support the idea of the no noble savage. So, um, can I? I'm just gonna highlight a couple of things about the artwork that you need to know. Um, there's a group of tents um, in the background. Um, in the right front, there's a mother nursing a baby. This is sort of like the Virgin Mother and um, and Jesus. It's a, it's a symbol of it. Um, an older child right here is gesturing towards the circle, drawing the viewer towards the towards the center. Um, European men are here. Um, we've got William Penn. He's here in the middle. He has a sober brown outfit with a white neckcloth. Okay. Um, and then remember we talked about the noble savage. So the way that they're dressed, the way that they look. Um, he emphasized the difference between the conservative, dark uh, Europeans and these bright, um, scantily clad Indians or Native Americans. Okay, and then moving on. Um, so Thomas Penn, um, he was different from his father. He rejected the Quakers, and um, so this is um, different than William Penn. He rejected the Quakers. He was 
he was infamous for his unfair treatment of the Lenape. Um, and then the most famous thing is the Walking Purchase of 1737, where he actually cheated the Lenape out of their land. And um, that's why the Indians sided um, with the French in the French and Indian War. Ben Franklin and the Quakers used the event as evidence against proprietorships to convince the king to use royal charters instead. So um, some of you may not know what that means. Um, how can I say this? Instead of people just going out and making their own um, deals and, and cheating, um, they tried to say like only the king or only like the president essentially can make can do the power, or can have the power to take over the land of people. So what happened was some of you confused like how did they cheat him? Um, what happens was he said um, Thomas Penn and James Logan they made this deal right, and what they said was. Um, they went to the Indians and they said, give me the area, um, the distance a man can walk in a day and a half. And they're like, okay, fine, that's easy. It's like, that's not that much, you know, to an Indian, it's like, oh, that's barely anything if you just have to walk for a day and a half. But then William Penn and, and James Logan, what they did is they hired three runners to walk the distance. And it turned out that the land was much farther and longer than the Indians thought it would be. So that's how they cheated them. Yeah, that sort of sucks. Okay, moving on, new, new, um, new person, William Hodges, he was born in London, he began an art school. He began painting, uh, painting landscape scenery for London Theatre. He traveled with James Cook, some of you may have heard of James Cook of the Pacific, and he traveled to India and painted works from both these trips, uh, mostly in landscapes, and his history was because he uh, traveled uh, across, the, across the oceans. And um, the consequences of war, the effects of peace, two of his um, anti-war artworks, uh, he was disgraced because of them, because they were anti-war, and they sort of left him poor and um, uh, sad. So here's a, this one's called A View of the Monuments um, by William Hodges. So here is one of the artworks that you need to know. Um, this shows, I'll zoom in later, but this is the Matabi Bay on Tahiti's northern coast. Um, so you may have heard of Tahiti. Uh, two, British flo uh, two British ships float in the center. Uh, the Tahitians go about their daily activities on the dock and around fishing ships. Um, Hodges, noble savages, they wear classical drapery and stand in contrapposto poses. Mount Orof uh, Orofena. Mount Orofina stands in the background, and a white tent on the left represents the temporary European settlement, Point Venus. The bay appears welcoming and hospitable. So, I could show you real quick. Zoomed in. Um, so you can see the English ships, and here's my noble savages. Okay, uh, we have two men paddling a canoe, uh, people in boats going about their daily activities. Uh, to create this painting, he used a lot of scale, so you can tell that these mountains are huge based on how tiny the things in the foreground are. Um, pretty cool picture, pretty cool landscape picture, and it's and it's showing um, when when they start to conquer, come over to Tahiti. Next one, um, Joseph Mallard. Um, William Turner, or you could say Turner. Um, Turner was born in London and attended the Royal Academy. He visited Europe and studied landscape painters. His landscapes were unusually large and depicted really dramatic scenes. The Dido Carthage building, um, his artwork, uh, was ancient Roman history and a monumental picturesque landscape. He also had one called Snowstorm, which had an ominous snowstorm um, trapping the ancient Roman leader in the mountain. So, here's his here's his uh, here's his work. Um, it's called Slave Ship. So you can see when we talked about these dramatic scenes, uh, maybe you could see it, so maybe you can't. And I'll zoom in. So again, this is from Turner. It's called Slave Ship. The horizontal line divides the piece horizontally, and the setting sun divides it vertically. So I sort of have a division of of my painting. We have enormous waves tossing a slave ship. In the foreground, slave arms reach up, struggling to stay afloat. We have a violent swirl of water, indicating sea animals attacking the slaves, and it fills the lower quadrant. The painting depicts the Zong Affair of 1781, and Captain Luke Collingwood, he threw 100 slaves overboard to get insurance benefits. So Turner added the typhoon as nature's judgment on the captain. So this is sort of a symbol, uh, symbolic of uh, nature attacking the captain for their their terrible deeds um, on the slaves. So let me zoom in for you. So pretty cool painting, huh? Um, I know it's pretty sad. I mean, they, they threw slaves into the water, but in terms of the artwork, it's pretty cool. Um, essentially, 
they he knew that the in this particular scene the captain Collingwood he knew that the insurance company would reimburse them for any slaves that were lost so um, but he doesn't reimburse them that um, died of sickness on board so that's why he threw like a hundred slaves chained together overboard so that he would receive more money um, yeah it's a pretty sad sad story and a sad painting so just real quick about the slave trade um, Turner based his painting off the account of the Zong affair Thomas Clarkson helped found the Society for Effecting the Abolition of Slave Trade in London in 1787. So this, this slave trade, the abolition of the slave trade um, helped basically abolish it. So in, um, the Parliament in 1807 and 1833 passed two acts, one called the British Slave Trade Act, and this one abolished slave trade in the British Empire. And then the Slavery Abolition Act um, also was only for the British Empire. So the British and the Foreign Anti-Slavery Society formed in 1839 um, so not only just do it just for Britain, but throughout the world. So that's about slave trade. All right, moving on to the next artwork. Uh, we have James Abbott McNeil Whistler. Whistler was born in Massachusetts and traveled considerably, uh, eventually living in Paris. He studied with Glare and befriended Gustave Courbet. He was an avid collector of Chinese imports, and he believed in art for art's sake and named his pieces with musical terms to avoid literal or moralizing interpretations. So for example, he had one called Nocturne in black and gold, the falling rocket. Um, and he accused him of flinging a pot of paint in the public space. Um, I'm not too sure what that means, but um, to, make a um, to make a long story short, um, how can I say this? Uh, he, was just, he was critiqued by John Ruskin. and. Um, I don't know, like he, he said that Ruskin said that that artwork wasn't that great and he got mad and he actually, Whistler actually sued him for, for public, for, for libel, for, for bad-mouthing him in public. So let's get to his work. I, I told you that he liked Chinese stuff, so um, here's the picture I could zoom in for you guys. Um, Purple and Rose, the long Lysen of the Six Marks. Okay. Um, I don't know why this is... Sorry, it's cut off, but purple and rose. So a woman sits surrounded by Chinese objects and holding a brush and a blue-white piece of porcelain. Um, she wears purple and rose uh, Chinese brocade robe. Okay. She wears makeup and has, um, uh, has her hair pulled back into a tight bun, representing the Chinese fashions. The British obsession with porcelain stemmed from desire for Chinese tea, so that's why they were obsessed with porcelain, because they wanted the Chinese tea. Britain and Holland at the time were fighting over this Chinese tea, and the Dutch Long Lysen design on the porcelain, uh, this, this sort of design on the porcelain sort of references or symbolizes this, this concept. Okay. Um, try to move on. Sorry if I'm going pretty quick. Again, you could pause if it's going too fast, but I've got two minutes left. John Frederick Lewis, who was born in London to an artistic family. Just like the others, he traveled, and he immersed himself in the culture and created over 600 watercolors. Upon his return, he turned his experiences into large-scale oil paintings. Since he lived it, um, his audience said, like, oh, this is reliable, this is true work. Um, the debate over North Africa, England, France, Ottoman Empire, they all, sorry, I know it's saving, they all vied for control of North Africa, especially Egypt. In the late 18th century, Napoleon attacked. England and Ottoman Empire drove him out. And la later, the Ottoman leader, Muhammad Ali, uh, drove out the British. The French built the Suez Canal in North Africa. And this canal provided water access to important trade outlets. And then Great Britain can gain control of Egypt. So there's this great um, contest for North Africa. So here's the, here's the uh, artwork from John Frederick Lewis called The Lady Receiving Visitors. The lady lies on a divan surrounded by servants, elaborate wooden screens. One servant sits with a gazelle, gold, blue, and red tiles. Uh, Emily Weeks said this painting was mostly historically accurate. Upper class homes did have gazelles as pets. Women were not allowed to be in the front room, though. So he's probably commenting on Ottoman treatment of women. So this is called a lady receiving visitors. Okay, how, how North Africa probably looked. All right, and then my last one, I'm going to skip over to the art. Well, um, two arts. This is uh, Yinka Shonabar. This is him right here. He grew up in Lagos, Nigeria. And I'm going to just get to his work. It looks like this. Um, I only have 10 seconds left, so that's all I can tell you. Um, just read the PowerPoint and sort of understand the symbolism behind this. So thanks for watching, um, and this closes the art section, and 
Can't wait to start music with y'all. All right, take care.